cases of human mutilation have occurred in the UK and that these incidents have all been covered up by the government. Margaret Thatcher, acting on a request from Ronald Reagan, set up a secret group to deal with and cover up incidents of human mutilation in the UK. He said he thought this issue was being covered up in order to keep control of society. He mentioned religion and how that might be affected. He says this statement that aliens are friendly, that he's obviously heard through watching media and whatnot, he says he was no way. It looked like a devil, which is possibly um, some kind of reptilian entity. It might be sacrifices, you, people might say, have to be made. Yeah. When you think that the United States government and, or whoever they are have killed all those people on 9-11, London bombings and all these other atrocities, as you know, mm. to further their cause, to enter a war, yeah. some other country, the Middle East or whatever, for them to agree or be happy to sit back and let a few men in the street, or women in the street, including children, mm. to be abducted, never to be seen again, and mutilated as well, mm. as long begs as the question. On page 257, Tony describes the Derek Goff story, although not referring to him by name. Another trusted contact, with whom I have had several conversations, has given me details of a quick response team set up by Margaret Thatcher's government, and as a result of her cooperation with President Reagan. The team, again made up of elite forces, was on permanent standby to attend the sites of any UFO landing or crash, carrying bleepers which would summon them any time they were needed. Helicopters were permanently ready to ferry them to the scene of the crash. Their role was to seal the site from the public, if necessary evacuating any civilians living within the sealed perimeter. They set up two cordons, a tight one around the actual UFO and a wider one to isolate the whole area within several hundred yards. They also attended sites of animal and human mutilations, which shocked and horrified them. As my contact said, they could accept the horror of war, but they were not accustomed to seeing such brutal wounds on animals and humans in peacetime. It was the secrecy surrounding the whole of their operation that made him feel it was his duty to alert the public to what was going on. Unfortunately, the first contact he made was with an inexperienced young UFO enthusiast, the book is referring to Derek Goff here, who secretly recorded their conversation. This young man played the tape to other UFO researchers and talked about it at their meetings. He was very naive because within days a mysterious fire broke out in his office at home and all his files were burned. He realised he was in over his head and contacted me. He sounded terrified. His wife was so frightened she moved out and left him. Luckily they are now back together again. But he made it clear that he wanted nothing more to do with this investigation and passed it over to me. The soldier had also decided it was a mistake to talk and he was very wary of me when I first contacted him. I had to send him photostats of my driving license and proof that I had been in the police before he would agree to talk to me. He told me he had discussed me with his colleagues from the quick response team and they had agreed to him helping me, as long as it was very discreet. They all shared his feeling that the public were being kept in the dark. They attended crash scenes across Europe including Spain and Germany. They were not supposed to make any recording of what they saw, but he has photographs of some of the mutilations, and also a piece of debris he picked up at the scene of a crash. At one site in Spain there were several human bodies spread around the site of the crash, all naked and without body hair, and all mutilated by having limbs etc. cut off. Although Tony does not mention it in his book, he was in possession of 11 photographs given to him by Derek Goff of two mutilated corpses recovered by the military team on Brecon Beacon, we think around 1990. <laughs> so we think that, um, yeah. that Tony probably didn't put it all in his book. No, no, he was quite well, sensitive. He, he was still a very loyal servant of the of the crown, Tony, mm -hmm. and a serving police officer for 25 years, you know, and I think he found difficulties often with the information he had and his loyalty to his past employers, you know, mm -hmm. the government. During his military service, which started in the 1980s, he claims to have witnessed between 30 and 40 mutilated human beings in countries including the UK, Ireland, Scotland, Spain, Germany, Alaska, Australia, Yugoslavia and Russia. The Black Ops group he was part of was a NATO-run operation in which the Yanks were in charge. He even said that Russia's military knew about what was going on 
but were happy to leave the clean-up operations to NATO teams who had access to better technology. The bodies recovered in retrieval missions had suffered the classic neat-edged surgical incisions with bloodless remains, identical to cases of animal mutilation. Once the team had sealed off and secured an area where bodies or other evidence were discovered, a second American team, which included scientists, would then be called out to remove the remains. He referred to this team as the Collectors. When corpses were removed by these teams, information would not be given to civilian authorities about the discovery of the remains. Individuals would be placed on missing persons registers indefinitely. If these 30 to 40 people uh, all got mutilated and were covered up by this military group. Um, how come we don't know about these people who gone missing? Or how don't, why aren't their relatives shown the bodies? Or why, why isn't it exposed? I asked Tony Dodd the same questions basically in one of our evening phone chats. Uh, I think it was probably after he told me about the Dolby Forest case of these seven unfortunate people who were recovered there. And I said to him, what about the relatives? What do they put on the death certificate? Mm -hmm. What does the post-mortem results say? What does the coroner's report say? Right? You know, and then there has to be a funeral. Mm -hmm. And he said, in his, his opinion, and I think his sources yeah. infer that the relatives of the victims are never actually informed that their lost missing person, their loved one, has been recovered. That person is still on the missing lists of right. the police files, which is terrible in itself, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that is terrible. So I think, and I think Tony agreed with me when I said that probably the bodies would be removed covertly and re sent down to somewhere like Porton Down in Wiltshire which is a very secret establishment there mm -hmm. might be there for a while and then they'll probably ship them to the United States. Did he, did he tell you what they, do, what they do with the bodies when the Americans take them away? RAF St Athens. RAF St Athens. The north side. The north side. That's coming up from Barry. So that was where they would always go? Yeah. And then presumably you don't know where after that? Or That's where the Ameri Americans were. Down in an hangar, he said it was a big building on the north side coming up from, as you're coming through Barry mm -hmm. towards Cardiff, mm -hmm. it's on the north side, you can see it there, he said. Right. The fast response, they could be anywhere. And they also had planes at their disposal. Right. And get anywhere. If it is a do within uh, British uh, jurisdiction, they would be there. Right. But the medicals would also be there as well. Right. And did he say, if it was a, somewhere that was more remote, did he say how they found out about the cases? Radar. So it was... Again. So it was, they've been so they can pick up the UFOs on radar and they can differentiate that it's a UFO then. Presumably. What he said, well, he, they can't say they know nothing about them because they're waiting for them. Right. Okay. Yeah. Did he give you the impression that sometimes he was sent terriers before the UFOs arrived? Yeah. Right. On on the expectation. All right. So they'd be dispatched before the UFOs arrived. Mm. That's interesting. But he didn't. He did, did he say anything about how they would know that? No. Um, they were sent to Salisbury Plain. Mm -hmm. Things are happening down there that there was um, uh, talking about mutilations down there as well. Mm -hmm. To find out what happened to the people there. Did he mention any mutilations were taking place other than in Wales? Yes, yeah, Scotland, Ireland. Right. Now we're talking about places in Ireland which is comes under the Republic, which is County Wicklow, Kilkenny. Right. The military had an idea roughly as to where and when the UFOs were appearing and would send their team out in advance of firing this weapon. Once the evidence is secured, another totally separate team would come to the site. This could take days. They refer to that team as the collectors, who were always American. They would leave with the evidence and would just leave the find and secure team to fend for themselves. He is still in touch with some of the soldiers from his team, two of whom have now died. He has seen hundreds of UFOs, some landed and some in the sky. There was a variety of different shapes. They were not flying saucer shaped, some triangular, others square or rectangular, not aerodynamic shapes. They ranged in size from the size of a car to three times the size of an articulated lorry. The surfaces were smooth and some had overlapping tiles. They usually had lights on them of varying colours and configurations. One craft gave off a light like an arc welder and caused damage to their eyes and he had to be admitted to hospital after that incident. Another craft which they got close to looked metallic, but when pushed by hand gave way, having some kind of elastic property which returned to the original shape after applying a force. 
He said he thought that because some of the craft were so small, there must be bigger mother-type ships which these craft had come from. I suggested that UFOs might use reservoirs as hiding places, and he said no, they don't go in reservoirs, although when asked where they do go, it seemed he wasn't sure. He said they just appear. He did not know where they were originating from, but stated they are here, meaning they are in our atmosphere regularly. He said they can just appear and when asked about cloaking confirmed that he thought they had those kind of abilities and also incredible dynamics. He said they can come down to the ground very quick. The first operation he was involved with was in northern Scotland and the largest recovery of bodies was in Australia, a case where 24 bodies had been left. Injuries are the same as animal mutilation type injuries. He said that internal organs would be removed and also brains. He seemed to think that anything connected with the nervous system is what they would take. He did not see a lot of blood on the corpses. They usually choose remote, out-of-the-way places to carry out human mutilations. They knew where to go and where to take from, where the people would not be missed for a long time. Bodies included people and children. He stated that in four or five of these cases there were craft debris and they were able to see what had been on board the craft. This included human and animal body parts. The few cases didn't appear in his book, right. in, in Tony Dodd's book, yeah. but he told you about them. He confided to me that uh, in North Yorkshire, in, in Dolby Forest, which is uh, part of the North Yorkshire National Park, and it's a huge area of forest, uh, sort of north of Pickering, uh, south, just south of um, uh, Fallingdale's early warning station, so you're sort of south of Whitby, so it's a massive area. And uh, this this area was quite renowned for animal mutilations, and he certainly had quite a few reported to him by a guy at work for the Forestry Commission, who he calls in his book Cedar. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's anything from um, deer, badgers, uh, sheep, uh, fox even, often in quite a small area, on one occasion blocking a road uh, where the witnesses reported to Tony that the police with some army personnel had blocked the road off uh, until they removed the, all the animals. Mm -hmm. This is all in Tony's book? Yes, it was in his book, but all this is in Dolby Forest. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite significant that over several years there's been a history of uh, mutilated dead animals found in the Dolby Forest area and round Raven's Glass and, sorry, Raven Scar and, and South Whitby in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, so he went on to tell me, coming back to the human mutilations, that uh, he knew, possibly from the same military guy, that uh, seven human beings had been found in the same field in, in a period over about three weeks. Uh, so I don't think they all appeared seven together this was seven different bodies and I don't know whether a male or female found in this same particular field and they had the classic mutilation injuries uh, tongue out jaw strips eyes out uh, and, and interestingly hair removed yes and that was a very strange thing I'd never come across and I don't know whether Tony had but there was uh, all the bodies were totally lacking any hair, you know, the hair follicles somehow had been mm -hmm. stripped and all the hair taken out. So it wasn't just the hair of the head or beards or, the, you know, the mm -hmm. pubic hair. It was all over, and uh, and, that, and that is similar to what Derek Goff described, uh, right, with the right. um, the Brecken Beacon case. Goodness me, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so now, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on, David. Oh, you just wanted to say that. Uh, the authorities had some sort of cover story cobbled together in case something leaked to the media and the and Tony was thought it was quite humorous in a way the, the, the idea was that somebody had been dumping mannequin dummies into the field it's often a step too far it clearly is for Linda Moulton Howe with all her vast experience of information she has upon earth files mm -hmm. she was a pioneer in bringing the animal mutilation uh, cases and information to the public domain. You know, bless her heart, she did a tremendous job and still is. But then she stops yeah. at this point 
of not non-acceptance of the human element and you have to ask the question why is she doing that has she been warned off and said if you want to continue doing what you're doing with coast to coast and all the rest of it you've got to not involve or mention or talk about human mutilations otherwise you're out of business lady I can I can hear them it's threatening she's been threatened she told me and Robert one day we were in Wiltshire she'd had a gun pointed in her face to threaten her because she was already overstepping the mark a bit even with the animals so that, that's, a, that's a clue to me that, you know, if she's getting threatened about her in, information she was divulging and promulgating on the internet about animals and all the talks and the books and all the rest of it, some, something stopped her. Derek wrote an article about the events in Global Magazine entitled 580 Security Interview. The editor advised that certain facts about the case be altered so the story seemed less credible because he was worried about the implications of revealing such sensitive information. After the article was published, Derek Goff was contacted by people claiming to be from mainstream media wanting his story and offered money. When he refused to cooperate with journalists, he then started to receive telephone threats not to further publish the information and finally suffered a very suspicious house fire which seemed to be targeted in his office. He suspects that the person who read his gas meter the day before the fire was a bogus caller who planted a device. The meter was not due to be read at that time. Can I just ask you about the name then? So it's group and then a space. Five five and then a space and then eight so it's not group 58 no it's group five is eight it, is it dash eight or? no it is group five eight group five eight security you were in touch with this magazine global mm. and you gave the story to global who printed it in a fashion but you know that the, 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 there were certain quite a number of mistakes in it yeah but and as a result of it appearing in the global magazine you then began to be contacted by people who wanted to buy the story to have the tapes and offered you money for it, mm. and it was ostensibly a, a, um, a, a person, a, a reporter from the press, I think you said he was from either the Times or the Guardian or something like this, who wanted to give the story, you refused um, the, the initial offer which was £100 or something like that, um, I forget just what, what amount of money was involved, um, the, the person gave a phone number and an address which t turned out to be false, he phoned you again, giving you another phone number, another address, offering him more money, and you didn't give the, 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 the details out because you, you wanted, because you were at the time receiving threats on the phone which were saying you will never ever be allowed to print the story. Yeah, but this is after you've printed it in the Global magazine. Yeah. Yes, but it was a bogus reporter wanting the story, right. wanted to buy the story, and wanted to have the tapes. Right. And once that had failed, Derek started to receive phone calls which said categorically you will not be allowed to tell the story. Basically you put out the story in, in, into that magazine, you then started getting contact by the press. You, you also gave me a News of the World card hmm. um, and you refused every time to, to give your story to them. Yeah I did yeah, because it was, I, I had a feeling, I was so mixed up, I wanted the story out but I didn't want no backlash yet. I just wanted rid of the story. Let's face it, you were frightened because of the anonymous phone calls that were made yeah, to you to, be honest, to yeah. say to say um, that you were un that you were in danger and that your story would never be allowed to be printed. Derek was contacted by somebody allegedly from a Metropolitan Police New Scotland Yard mm -hmm. who wanted to know information about Matthew Williams. Derek said, I know Matthew Williams but I can't give you the information. Subsequently, um, he, he rang up late one evening, probably about 11.30 in the evening, this guy rang up Derek to say, there's a, a warrant out for Matthew Williams' address. Do you know where he is? Arrest. Arrest. Yeah. Do you know where he is? So Derek said, well, no. He said, he said, I don't know where he is. Why should I know? Well, they said, if you do find out any information, make sure you let us know because he's wanted, warrants have been issued for his arrest, he's wanted by this, that and the other. And, um, we believe that this person was trying to discredit Derek. Subsequently, uh, when at 2.30 in the morning we managed to get in touch with, uh, with Matthew Williams because Derek rang up and he's at his home, mm -hmm. we found out the story was false. 
So Derek rang up this guy um, in a Whitehall number, News Gatling Yard number, saying, um, what the hell are you playing at? Uh, there's no arrest warrant out for Matthew Williams. What the hell are you playing at? Mm -hmm. So the reply came back, Derek, they said, you're good at what you do. I have to apologise. He said, I was told to pass this story on to you. So if you had then come out publicly and said there's a warrant out for Matthew's arrest, it would have made you looked after as if you were lying about yeah, that. Yeah, so and any, any subsequent stories therein or yeah. what I was on about them would have been blown out of the water. When the phone rang and Derek said, the bastards set fire to my house. I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. I right. put the phone down and I, I, I was shaking. Right. I was absolutely shaking.